Good afternoon, everybody, and thanks for uh, joining us today. Um, our public health media briefing will begin in just a couple of minutes. Just wanted to, to give you a, a heads up. Hi, Tim, ready to go. Okay, give me one second, we'll begin. Okay, thanks. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for your patience and uh, starting today. Uh, welcome to the public health media briefing. Uh, today, Dr. Fur will make a few uh, remarks to give you an update on COVID-19 in LA County. We'll then uh, take your questions. If you'd like to be put into a queue to ask a question, uh, click on the hand icon, which is in the participant panel. Um, and then after the questions um, uh, and answer time, we'll be doing remarks in Spanish. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to the Director of Public Health, Dr. Barbara Ferrer. Oh yeah, thanks so much, Tim. And, and thank you for joining me for today's briefing. Uh, this afternoon, I'll be talking about our trends in cases, hospitalizations and deaths by vaccination status, age group and race and ethnicity. And I'll be able to provide uh, some more detail on the characteristics of people hospitalized with COVID by vaccination status. I'm also going to review our vaccination progress and give an update on cases, outbreaks, and mitigation and prevention strategies at our schools. I'll take the first slide. I'm sad to report 31 additional deaths. At least 24 of the people who died had underlying health conditions. And this does bring the total number of deaths to 25,181 in LA County. I do wanna note that due to increased volume of testing in LA, there have been recent delays in the processing of lab reports uh, into our data systems. Um, so we may have some under-reporting and we may get some backlog cases. Uh, overall, I don't think it affects our, our weekly case counts um, or our rates, but just want to know there's a little bit of fluctuation uh, as we work to increase the processing speed and capacity uh, to keep up with the increased volume. Uh, to everyone who's uh, lost friends and family during this difficult time, uh, we are wishing you peace and comfort and our prayers are with you. We are reporting 3,226 new cases today bringing the total number of cases in LA County to 1,394,488. To date, more than 8 million people have been tested and had test results reported in LA County. Our daily test positivity rate is 2.75%. This is a decrease from last week's same day rate of 3.7%. This likely reflects the increases that we're seeing in routine screening testing which as you know, primarily occurs among people who have no symptoms. Our daily average case rate with a three day lag is now 26.6 cases per 100,000 people. This is a very small increase from last week's three day lagged case rate of 28 cases per 100,000 people. There are currently 1,731 people hospitalized with COVID and this is a small decrease of about 59 people uh, over the past week. Currently, we have 334 open investigations at residential congregate settings and non-residential settings with at least one confirmed case of COVID-19. We can go on to the next table. Uh, in order to assess the risk of COVID in LA County, we use the CDC indicators and the thresholds to categorize community transmission of COVID-19. Uh, you'll note that this framework uses the seven day case rate, meaning it's the number of cases uh, per 100,000 over the past week, 
rather than what we're used to doing here, which is a daily case rate. Uh, nonetheless, transmission does remain in the high level with our seven day cumulative case rate now at about 188 new cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, this does represent a welcomed 8% decrease uh, from last week. We can go on to the next slide. This graph shows our trends in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths uh, from the beginning of the pandemic through August 18th. Uh, although cases represented by the green trend line here are being reported at rates ranging between 2,500 and 3,000 cases a day, you can see on here that we're seeing a small downturn in the seven day average case numbers. And in the past week, we've seen cases decrease by about 15%. Uh, however, uh, with increased routine screening testing over the weeks ahead, I do think that our case numbers will remain relatively high. The rise of hospitalizations has also slowed somewhat, rising over the past week uh, to an average of 1,777 beds filled with people testing positive on any given day. Uh, but this is a slower rate of increase than what we've seen in the past. Uh, deaths have also risen about 6% over the past week uh, to a seven day average of 18 deaths per day. This is a reminder that the virus does continue to cause serious life threatening illness among many who are infected. And our losses are frankly all the more tragic because of the fact that nearly all of them are preventable with our extremely safe and widely available vaccines. Take the next slide. As always, we track the effectiveness of the vaccines by looking at the experiences of everyone who is vaccinated. This slide shows data for those fully protected by vaccines to scale. The large green box represents the 5.2 million residents who are fully vaccinated. The tiny purple box in the left lower corner of the green box represents the 32,678 fully vaccinated people who tested positive for COVID as of August 24th, 2021. While this is an increase of about 20% since last week, still less than 1% of all of those vaccinated have become infected with COVID. Of those who tested positive, we've now had 881 people who were hospitalized. Uh, this again is an increase from last week, uh, and it's about 0.017% of all fully vaccinated people having ended up in the hospital. Deaths in this group over this interval also increased from 68 to 95. Uh, and this small increase now puts deaths among fully vaccinated people at 0.0018%. In these incremental increases, we do see this reality that the vaccines do not provide 100% protection from infections, hospitalizations, or deaths. When the community transmission is high, which is where we've been for a while now, more fully vaccinated people are becoming infected. However, we can also see in these numbers the reality that fully vaccinated people continue to be extraordinarily well protected from hospitalizations, and they continue to be very unlikely to die from COVID. The next slide. In the next slides, I'll be showing outcomes by vaccination status stratified by race and ethnicity. In these slides, unvaccinated groups are usually represented by dotted lines, while vaccinated groups are represented by solid lines. Beginning this week, data from partially vaccinated people will not be included on these slides since their experience may be different from those not vaccinated at all. With relatively small numbers of partially vaccinated people among cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, we haven't been able to complete an analysis yet of this group's unique experience but we hope that we'll be able to share that with you shortly in the weeks uh, coming up. But the first slide now shows that the highest rate of cases is among black unvaccinated people, and that's represented by the solid blue line, followed by Latinx and white unvaccinated people represented by the gray and dotted and red dotted lines. It's important to note that while black residents continue to have the highest case rate, there has been a 28% decline in this rate over the past two weeks. We are concerned, however, by the continued rise in the case rate among unvaccinated Latinx residents who've seen their case rate increase by 200% over the last month. 
Meanwhile, as you can see, cases have risen very slowly among vaccinated members of, of all of the rest of the groups, of all of the groups, and among both vaccinated and unvaccinated Asian residents, which are represented by the green solid and dotted lines. The next slide. On this slide showing case rates in adults, you'll note that the rates differ considerably, both by vaccination status and by age group. The highest rates are among unvaccinated, <coughs> sorry, unvaccinated adults between the ages of 18 and 49. And that's represented here by the solid orange line. And hopefully you can see that the next highest case rates are among unvaccinated older adults represented by a dashed orange line. And below them, vaccinated younger adults in the solid green line and vaccinated older adults in the dashed green line with the lowest rates. The higher risk in younger unvaccinated individuals is likely due to their intermingling with many others at their jobs, at their schools, and in their social lives. Case rates for all groups, though, as you can see here, have declined slightly. Next slide. We'll continue to report on the experiences of children under 18 as schools reopened for in person instruction. As you can see, there's about a fourfold difference in the case rate between vaccinated children that's represented here in the. In the green dotted line and unvaccinated children represented here in the orange dotted line. Importantly, while case rates amongst almost all other age groups declined this past in these past couple of weeks, cases among unvaccinated children rose from 73 to 307 cases per 100,000. And there was a slight increase, uh, which is smaller among vaccinated children from 11 to 78 cases per 100,000. Next slide. When examining the data about who is hospitalized, you can see that once more, the highest hospitalization rates are among unvaccinated black residents represented by the dotted blue line, followed by unvaccinated white and Latinx represent, re residents represented by the red and gray lines. Meanwhile, hospitalization rates remain very low among vaccinated individuals of all races. It does appear that hospitalization rates slightly declined for both black and Latinx unvaccinated individuals these past two weeks and stabilized for other groups. This provides hope that if we can keep our case numbers declining, hospitalization, also, hospitalization numbers will also follow and subsequently continue to decrease. You can look at the next slide. When we look by age group at who is now getting hospitalized, we can see that the highest hospitalization rate continues to be among older unvaccinated adults, represented here by the dashed orange line. While there was some state, while there was some stabilization in hospitalizations in this age group over uh, these uh, second week in August, unvaccinated adults 50 and over were still more than 15, 15 times more likely to be hospitalized than their vaccinated counterparts. Hospitalizations in younger unvaccinated adults, represented here by the solid orange line, are also rising. Relative to unvaccinated adults. Hospitalization rates among vaccinated adults at all ages remain very low with very little increase. Next slide. The difference in hospitalization rates for unvaccinated and vaccinated children continues to be particularly striking, although the numbers uh, in, of children are very small uh, who have been hospitalized. So the hospitalization rate for unvaccinated children is about one hospitalization for every 100,000 children. Nevertheless, this is much higher than the virtually non-existent hospitalizations among the vaccinated children. And that's represented by that flat dotted uh, green line. It's important to note that again, included in the orange dotted trend line that represents unvaccinated children are children under 12 who, as we all know, remain ineligible for COVID vaccines. We'll take the next slide. Um, you, we also looked at the differences among people 16 and older who were hospitalized with a positive COVID test on the basis of their vaccination status. I showed you some of this data last time. In the first line, you can see that the median age of fully vaccinated people who are hospitalized is 15 years older than that of hospitalized people who are not fully vaccinated. And as I reported last week, about 3% fewer fully vaccinated people 
who were hospitalized were admitted to the intensive care unit when compared to their non fully vaccinated counterparts. It's about 15% compared to almost 18%. And that a smaller proportion were intubated, uh, about 5.8% compared with 7%. Combined, these findings suggest that vaccination contributes to a less severe course of hospitalization among people who end up infected with COVID. And it also uh, lets us know that uh, the majority of people who are fully vaccinated and end up hospitalized with COVID are likely to be much older uh, than people who are unvaccinated. Our teams have been reviewing the charts of hospitalized people diagnosed with COVID between April 1st and August 12th of this year. Among patients hospitalized for COVID, uh, those fully vaccinated people who were sick enough to require hospitalization were much more likely, as you can see here, to have chronic diseases at baseline. While only about a third of non fully vaccinated people have three or more comorbidities or other diseases, serious diseases, nearly half of fully vaccinated people who are hospitalized fell into this category seriously ill with lots of complicating factors. Certain conditions also stood out as occurring much more commonly among fully vaccinated hospitalized people than among their unvaccinated counterparts. This included type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure. Both occurred about one and a half times more commonly among fully vaccinated hospitalized patients. Neurologic or neurodevelopmental disorders, three times more common amongst uh, fully vaccinated individuals. And cancer, which was about four times uh, more common. Next slide. Uh, vaccinations do continue to offer powerful protections against dying. The same pattern that we saw in hospitalization rates among racial and ethnic groups plays out in death rates with these rates highest among unvaccinated black, white, and Latinx residents. That's represented by the dotted blue, red, and gray lines. Death rates did remain flat among all other vaccinated groups, as well as for unvaccinated Asian residents. Go on to the next slide. Uh, we do continue to see this upward trend in deaths. Uh, as a reminder, deaths lag behind both hospitalizations and cases. So when we start seeing declines in cases uh, followed shortly afterwards by some small declines in hospitalizations, it will take another few weeks for that to be seen among uh, our death rates. Uh, but you also can notice here that our death rate in unvaccinated adults over 50, that's indicated by the dashed orange line, orange line increased from 10.3 to 14 deaths per 100,000 people in the week between August 7th and the 14th. Uh, we're also seeing a much slower, lower rise in the death rate among unvaccinated adults between 18 and 49, which is encouraging. Uh, it went from uh, 1.3 deaths per 100,000 people to 1.9 deaths per 100,000 people. The next slide. But as you can see, almost nobody died who was vaccinated. And, and you can see this more clearly on this slide. It summarizes uh, for one week uh, that ended uh, August 14th, uh, some of the above data that we just looked at in trend lines for cases, hospitalization, and death rates. Looking at this by vaccination status, race, and ethnicity. Uh, and it also, you can see it places alongside it at the very end of the table, the percent in each racial and ethnic group that's received at least one dose of the vaccine. You're going to notice that case hospitalization and death rates are much higher among unvaccinated members of all groups than they are among the vaccinated. Furthermore, while case and hospitalization rates are highest among our unvaccinated black residents, unvaccinated white residents are now the group with the highest death rates. Again, this is one week of data. Vaccinated people continue to have rates for all outcomes that are many fold lower than their unvaccinated counterparts. They're four to eight times less likely to be hospitalized and five to seven times less likely to die from an infection. The death rate, as you can see on this chart, uh, among black residents is currently so low that we couldn't make a, a comparison for this group uh, for this past week. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Looking at these same outcomes uh, by age group for the week ending August 14th, uh, you can see that the highest case rates continue to be among unvaccinated younger adults aged 18 to 49, with now a rate of 510 new cases per 100,000 people and that unvaccinated people in all age groups are four to five times more likely to become infected than their vaccinated counterparts. 
hospitalizations were virtually non-existent among vaccinated children below the age of 18. And again, a small rate of uh, unvaccinated children ending up being hospitalized, but significantly more than what's occurring for vaccinated children. Unvaccinated younger adults, 18 to 49, were 27 times more likely to be hospitalized than their vaccinated counterparts. And unvaccinated older adults, 50 and older, were 15 times more likely to be hospitalized. Uh, and the differences in the death rates are stark. Uh, unvaccinated adults aged 18 to 49 have a death rate of almost two deaths per 100,000 people, compared with almost no deaths in vaccinated members of this age group. Meanwhile, adults over 50 who were unvaccinated were 28 times more likely to die as a result of COVID than their vaccinated counterparts. We continue to see broad protection from the vaccine against all outcomes in all age groups. We'll go on to the next slide. You know, as always, we're going to remain focused on making it as easy as possible for those not yet vaccinated to get vaccinated, especially given the high rate of transmission from Delta and the ample evidence of the effectiveness of the vaccines. As of August 22nd, 90% of LA County residents 65 and older received at least one dose of the vaccine, as have 75% of residents 16 and over, 74% of residents 12 and over. 64% of residents 12 and over have been fully vaccinated. Of LA County teens between the ages of 12 and 17, 61% received at least one dose and 63 and 53% are fully vaccinated. Countywide, 17,364 third doses have been administered to immunocompromised people. Out of all of our nearly 10.3 million LA County residents, including those who are not yet eligible for the vaccine, 63% have received at least one dose and 55% are fully vaccinated. We're getting a lot of questions uh, from the public and our partners about booster shots, which as I've noted in the past are different from the third doses being offered to immunocompromised people. Booster shots, when they're made available, and that will be with approval by both the FDA and CDC, will be aimed at increasing antibody levels in people who have likely already had good protective immune response to the vaccine but whose antibody levels may have waned uh, somewhat over time. Booster shots are not unique to COVID vaccinations. We give tetanus booster shots to adults every 10 years to boost immunity to tetanus infections also. In the case of COVID vaccines, booster shots are still a likelihood, uh, but they're not yet a recommendation. There are currently no CDC recommendations for boosters, and the announcement recently made about boosters was intended, it was intended really as guidance for planning purposes. Uh, the FDA and the CDC are reviewing the data on this issue, I believe, next week. And once those data indicate the need for booster shots, they will recommend them. And here in LA County, we will be ready to go ahead and, and uh, get those uh, out and into the arms of people uh, who need them. Next slide. Uh, this chart that I show every week uh, shows the first doses administered each week. Um, and note that there is a lag in the data reporting, so numbers for the latest week can often underestimate the number of doses administered by anywhere from 4,000 to 10,000 doses. Uh, currently, you can see that between August 16th and the 22nd, we administered about 70,000 doses across the entire county network. I do think that number will rise uh, as the additional doses are reported. But while we're immensely grateful to everyone who is already vaccinated, and we continue to appreciate how hard our vaccination partners are working to vaccinate as many residents as fast as we can, we do need to do a better job of reaching those not yet vaccinated to help us slow down the spread of COVID. Go on to the next slide. And, uh, and it's easy to see where we have the most work to do. Uh, groups with vaccination rates below 50% are marked in red this week while the remainder are in white. Uh, the good news is there's very little red on this slide. However, the subgroups where we do see extremely low vaccination rates are concentrated entirely among Black and Latinx residents who already, as we all know, suffered so much during the pandemic. Uh, and though we're grateful that we continue to see increases in vaccination rates across all subgroups, uh, there is a persistent gap between Black residents and other racial and ethnic groups that remains 
even as numbers within these subgroups inch upward. If you look at the totals by age group running across the bottom of this table, you'll note that all age groups, with the exception of 12 to 15 year olds, are now vaccinated at a rate of 64% or higher. And this is a step in the right direction. We do have a lot of room for progress, and we're going to need to see much faster gains to turn around the disproportionality in cases, hospitalizations, and deaths, which are so low, low, closely linked, as you can see on this table, to vaccination status. We'll go on to the next slide. With many school districts countywide now reopening, I do want to update you on what we're learning from our visits to schools over the past few weeks. As I shared last week, our school technical assistants or STAT teams reach out and visit schools proactively to assess preventive, preventative readiness and then to be able to advise on any options uh, for areas of improvement. During recent visits, the STAT educators have found that schools with significant safety enhancements have broad support within the school community for promoting and implementing masking guidance. They also have symptom pre-screening tools that allow for the early detection of sick students, consistent with COVID-19 screening testing. They have consistent COVID-19 screening testing programs as well, and they have signage campus-wide to remind staff and students about safety, masking, distancing, and sanitation. Meanwhile, areas of improvement at many schools included attending to crowd prevention control, constituting safety compliance teams, identifying space to implement isolation rooms, and implementing mealtime crowd control strategies. Our teams also noted the potential for improvement with communication with parents and staff about testing and vaccination opportunities and case identification and contact tracing requirements. Many schools would also benefit from being able to have more signage uh, from opening, from updating their reopening protocols and sharing those with the entire school community and increasing sanitizing in shared spaces. Our teams do plan to add additional support to schools to assist with contact tracing and implementing appropriate quarantining of students and staff. As a reminder, fully vaccinated students and staff at K-12 schools are not required to quarantine as long as they re remain asymptomatic during the 14 day quarantine period. We're going to be sending public health staff to schools that identify large numbers of exposed students to help manage quarantining of students and staff, recognizing how stressful and disruptive quarantining is to a stable learning environment and to parents and caregivers. It is important to note that identifying close contacts of a confirmed case is always required in all settings, including workplaces, social gatherings, and houses of worship for some, just to name some examples. This is done to try to separate those who may be at risk of spreading COVID. Isolation and quarantine are very effective at reducing transmission once a positive case is identified. And we have standard requirements across just about all settings. We're also aware that many school districts and parents have asked us to align with the state's modified quarantine policy for students in grade K to 12. Given that the data supporting a modified quarantine policy at schools was developed looking at information that was collected last spring pre-Delta, and we've seen large increases in cases among school children since the summer, we determined in August that it was best to not modify the quarantine policy until we could look at the case and outbreak data we have for LA County schools. And that's what we're doing now. We're in the process of reviewing this data and working with the LA County Office of Education and school districts to determine the best ways to reduce risks at schools. If our data supports low transmission between cases and close contacts at school settings, we'll move quickly to align the quarantine policy. But as always, we try to be cautious in situations that can, that can place children, educators, and their families at risk. And we always try to use the data we have to make informed decisions about how to best mitigate the spread of this dangerous virus. I do join with you in wishing that it was a lot simpler and that rules didn't need to change, but the virus has changed and we all need some flexibility to adapt to this more dangerous variant. We're grateful to the districts and the parents who have worked so hard to support their schools in ensuring the safety of students, teachers, and the many staff who work in all of the county schools. 
we can go on to the next uh, table. Uh, the early data we do have on schools is somewhat sobering. This table shows the total number of individual case reports received from K to 12 school settings countywide over the week of August 16th through the 22nd. And it also shows how many of each type of school setting has reported one, two, or three or more cases over this one week interval. As you can see, a total of 3,186 new cases were reported this past week. Many of them were from LAUSD, where everyone is tested weekly, with the second highest number coming from other K-12 schools across the county. In settings serving children, the proportion of cases vaccinated was in single digits, while 17% of new cases at school offices or work sites were among people who were fully vaccinated. The overwhelming majority of sites with cases report only one case. However, there are 15 LAUSD sites and 48 other school sites where they've reported two cases. And as you can see, there are 84 LAUSD and 39 other school sites that reported three or more cases. In all of these instances where there are three or more cases, our team is hard at work determining whether this is an outbreak and if it is an outbreak at a school setting, we work closely with the school community uh, to make sure that uh, we're mitigating appropriately. We can go on to the next slide. We are keeping the close eye about on outbreaks at LA County schools and school affiliated programs, and this includes youth sports. A probable outbreak is when there are three or more cases with probable transmission, transmission occurring at schools or at school activities. You can see the numbers. We had lots of places where schools reported three or more students and, and or staff were po testing positive, but we don't have a lot of cases, uh, a lot of places where we've identified outbreaks. Through last week, we've been seeing three outbreaks a week with between 23 to 37 students and zero to 60 staff infected each week. So far this week, although this is only through yesterday, We've seen five outbreaks involving a total of 27 students and three staff. We anticipate an upward trend in outbreaks as our schools have reopened, but we're continuing to work hard to prevent, investigate, and manage them as they happen. It's worth noting that of the 14 school outbreaks that opened in August, half were associated with school sports. Team athletic activities have some features that make them particularly challenging settings in which to control transmission. And if we go on to the next slide, I can share an example of settings where outbreaks are occurring uh, just to help understand why they can become uh, so challenging. Between July 30th and August 20th, we opened nine outbreaks among high school cheerleading and dance teams that involved 10 staff and 131 students. All nine of the outbreaks were associated with two to four day indoor camps that took place at facilities outside of LA County. All of these camps gathered student athletes from multiple schools and schools were asked to enforce their own mass policies among their students in attendance, which really means for some school districts where they have a mass policy, their students were masked and in other situations, if there wasn't a mass policy, the students uh, did not come each day with masks on. Reportedly, many in attendance didn't wear their masks during cheer and dance activities. Most of the teams with outbreaks also use school and charter buses for transportation to bring students uh, to the camps uh, each day. Uh, and uh, again, on the, on the transportation, there was variable wearing of masks by team members uh, during their transit. Eight of the nine outbreaks uh, were among teams uh, where athletes also shared some hotel rooms with two to six other athletes. Between 33% and 67% of all those at risk for infection ended up testing positive. This really means that of the close contacts that were identified in this particular situation, 33 to 67% of those identified as close contacts have ended up testing positive. And among four outbreaks that involved vaccinated people, between 38% and 77% of the cases ended up being among fully vaccinated people. There have been fortunately no hospitalizations or deaths associated with any of these uh, nine outbreaks. 
Our, found, our findings from these outbreaks suggest that transmission risk is high with close, sustained, unmasked contact between people, especially when they're engaging in physical exertion. And in this case, most of the activities were happening indoors. Next slide. Uh, we again have been asked a lot about what our guidance is. Why did we make our guidance on youth sports? Um, you know, what informed us and, uh, you know, which I'll talk about that guidance in a second. Uh, and, you know, since the state has not issued uh, guidance uh, for youth sports, we did go to CDC to look at what they were recommending for youth sports. And this summarizes their testing recommendations for K-12 activities, including youth sports which vary according to the level of community transmission. In areas of substantial transmission, and this is not LA County, as indicated by the red box, CDC, by, by the orange box, uh, CDC recommends that screening testing be offered to students participating in high risk sports and activities, particularly for those that are unvaccinated. At the level of high community transmission, this is where we are now in LA County, CDC actually recommends canceling or holding high risk sports and extracurricular activities virtually unless all of the participants are fully vaccinated. Moderate risk sports in communities with high transmission should require weekly testing for all unvaccinated participants. Now we can go on to the next slide. Because as we all noted and have seen example after example that youth sports programs can be a high risk environment uh, for COVID transmission. We did issue uh, last week the requirements and best practices for youth sports, sport events and leagues, uh, including school uh, teams. Our current youth sports guidance attempts to align with CDC while not precluding those not vaccinated from engaging in high risk sports or extracurricular activities and instead adding in additional layers of protection. According to our guidance, Face coverings are required for all participants indoors, regardless of vaccination status. Participants can remove their masks when they're eating or drinking, and when they're doing so, they're encouraged to keep a six foot distance for others. They can also remove masks, obviously, during indoor water sports where you can't wear a mask. We do encourage that practices and games can be moved outdoors whenever feasible. Uh, and, uh, and when they're not, that players may need to bring more than one mask uh, so that they can change masks if they're getting wet or soiled. This is only for indoors. Masks indoors, again, are required of all spectators, coaches, and employees, regardless of vaccination status. Uh, I want to note that employees that work in youth sports settings are subject to the Cal OSHA standards, uh, and everyone should uh, take a hard look at those and make sure there's compliance uh, with providing employee, employees upon request if they're not vaccinated. Uh, with uh, higher grade uh, respirators. Uh, we do recommend that employees mask in crowded outdoor spaces and uh, if they're out outdoor sporting events that are attended by more than 10,000 people, uh, all employees should be wearing uh, face coverings except while eating or drinking. We strongly recommend vaccination for all student athletes 12 years and over and for all coaches and team staff. We also ask participants and their families to self screen for symptoms of COVID-19 and require programs to exclude or isolate symptomatic participants, coaches, and, spec and spectators, and to notify us immediately if there are confirmed cases so we can help uh, with the management of isolation and quarantine. We can go on to the next slide. Uh, we do recommend continued efforts to distance by reducing crowding wherever possible in youth sports settings. This does include moving activities outdoors to reduce the transmission risk, and where activities are indoors, uh, we recommend reducing the number of participants, coaches, and spectators wherever possible. Routine testing is required regardless of vaccination status for athletes and staff that participate in moderate or high risk sports. Uh, you can find a list of these sports uh, in the guidance document that's on our website. Testing should be done once a week at minimum, and we strongly recommend that unvaccinated participants and staff be tested twice a week. Tests done at schools are ready. If, you're, if your student uh, is already getting, if your child or your student is already being tested once a week, that satisfies this requirement uh, and they don't need another, another weekly test. 
We're also going to change our guidance to require a negative test of all athletes and staff members now within 72 hours of inner team competition um, so that uh, it's um, a lot easier for everybody to get that testing done uh, before they go to those events. Again, this is aligning uh, with uh, CDC best practices. I want to note that ventilation plays an important role in reducing transmission risk. And this is particularly important for indoor activities. So please ensure that the building HVAC systems are in good working order. And you should consider portable high efficiency air cleaners or building upgrades that allow the highest efficiency of air filtration. Uh, we can go on to the, the next slide. The more cases we see in schools, the more staff and students that are gonna be required to quarantine or isolate. As a reminder, quarantine and isolation both refer to periods of reduced contact with others. The difference is that quarantine takes place after you've had an exposure to a person who's tested positive, while isolation takes place uh, after you have been, after you, when you are identified as a case. I'd like to review what parents and schools need to know about quarantine and isolation. First, parents should be aware that children should not be sent to school if they're under isolation or quarantine orders, or if they have a fever or any other signs of being sick. Once at school, students may be screened for COVID systems, uh, which often can overlap with cold symptoms, or they may have their temperature taken at the time they enter school. Children may not be allowed to enter the school if they're sick or they have a fever on arrival. If students develop symptoms during the school day, they may be isolated from other students and sent home as soon as possible. It's therefore wise for parents and caregivers to have an emergency child care plan in place in case this unexpected uh, illness uh, occurs uh, during the school day. For K-12 schools, our rules for quarantining close contacts do not require fully vaccinated staff and students to quarantine as long as they are asymptomatic. We do recommend that they self-monitor for COVID-19 symptoms for two weeks after their last date of an exposure, and that they should be tested for COVID three to five days after that last exposure. If there is uh, an event where they develop symptoms or they test positive, uh, they then need to be treated as a case and subject to the isolation guidelines, which as you know, are detailed on the website. Staff contacts who are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated do need to quarantine 10 days from their last exposure date. And while they may return to school thereafter, they need to wear a mask and self-monitor for COVID-19 symptoms through day 14. We also recommend that these staff be tested on day three to five after they've had an exposure to enable early diagnosis. If the test is positive, the staff will be treated as a take case and subject to the isolation guidelines. Student contacts that are unvaccinated or partially vaccinated need to quarantine uh, 10 days from their last exposure date. The quarantine can be shortened if a test that is performed on or after day six following their exposure yields a negative result. In this case, the student can end their quarantine uh, after day seven uh, if they have no symptoms. Schools can take some steps to reduce unnecessary quarantining of students by using seating charts in classrooms, encouraging physical distancing as much as possible outside of classrooms, and encouraging all students 12 years and older to get vaccinated as soon as possible. Next slide. I know how eager our students, parents, teachers, and staff have been to return to school. And we're very hopeful that we can prevent disruptions in learning that result from high rates of transmission in our community and now in our schools. And there are some steps that everyone can take to give your community schools the best uh, opportunity to stay safe and stay open. For children in middle school and high school, the best way to keep your school safe and open is to get vaccinated. When you're vaccinated, you're less likely to catch COVID, even if you're exposed. And it also means that if you are exposed, you do not need to quarantine. If you end up uh, getting infected, you're much less likely to get sick. And that means a quicker return to life as usual once uh, your isolation period uh, has ended. Participating in contact tracing is critical for ensuring that close contacts uh, get notified that they need to quarantine before they have an opportunity to infect other people. 
I do want to note that this week we're updating the health officer orders that you receive uh, if you need to isolate or quarantine. To uh, note that people do need to call us within 24 hours of receiving the order and the number will be on the order so that you can participate in contact tracing interviews unless you've already been reached by somebody from public health. Contact tracing goes hand in hand with adhering to isolation and quarantine orders. Uh, staying away from others when you're sick means you're less likely to spread the infection to them and that makes it less likely that they need to quarantine themselves. Participating in contact tracing and following quarantine orders can make the difference between having a handful of kids or hundreds of kids out of school. And finally, wearing your mask indoors and in crowded outdoor spaces means you're much less likely to be considered a close contact uh, unless uh, you're in uh, an indoor school setting, um, even if you're near somebody who has COVID. It also makes you less likely to get infected and to get sick. Teens 12 and over can receive the Pfizer vaccine at any of our county and city sites without any appointment. And you can visit our website at vaccinatelacounty.com to find a site close to you. Additionally, many school districts and individual schools, uh, and you have some flyers here from Los Nietos Middle School, Whittier Union, and Wilsonona, Wilsona. Uh, they're offering vaccinations over the next week, along with LAUSD, which has 45 standing school sites uh, and rolling out mobile vaccine, uh, mobile vaccine teams uh, at every middle and high school in their district. So please ask your school site for their vaccination schedule. Uh, thank you, and now I'll take your questions. Our first question will come from Elizabeth Cho with uh, the Daily News. Hello. Um... I have three questions. They're all about homelessness or the homeless population. Um, so the first question I have is, um, it's a bit unclear right now how LA's um, anti-camping law 4118 will be enforced and how faithfully street engagement strategies being discussed right now will be followed or if they'll be actually adopted. So um, particularly given the mounting pressure around clearing encampments quickly, but it is already raising concerns among some that there could be displacement of people in encampments and that the effects of the law could go against CDC guidance and could even affect public health led vaccination efforts. Um, so what are the Department of Public Health officials recommendations around implementation of 4118 and how is uh, the Department of Public Health getting engaged on this issue? Um, the second question is around the fact that there is this law going into effect and also the project room key ramp down and that could drive up um, the need for congregate shelters which are considered an inevitable placement option for people leaving room key so i'm wondering about the um the status of you know public health um or COVID 19 protections at shelters um including whether or not you know there are any efforts or talks of um, doing regulations or orders around how shelters are, um, you know, what measures are placed at shelters to prevent outbreaks? Um, Why don't I go ahead? I mean, we have a lot of questions here. Um, okay. So let me just try to answer these and then leave time for other folks. Um, uh, you know, we, ha we have a, a close partnership, obviously, uh, with uh, LASA. Uh, with um, our partners over at the Department of Health Services, our partners at the City of LA, um, to make sure that we're providing uh, services uh, to all people who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, there's a big effort underway, as you know, to get people uh, access to vaccines, uh, but also uh, efforts to make sure that those people who uh, are infected and those people who have an exposure are able to isolate and quarantine appropriately. Some of that is work that we do case by case, um, uh, trying to account for individual needs. Uh, we do have ample beds uh, for quarantine and isolation across the county for people experiencing homelessness and others who need support during quarantine and isolation. And we do work closely with uh, interim housing facilities uh, to make sure that uh, they too are able to appropriately manage uh, cases uh, that may occur uh, at their facility, often by setting up 
uh, rooms for uh, people who may need to quarantine and also uh, setting up space for those who are positive and need to be in isolation. I think it's, uh, you know, it, it continues to be uh, a, a, an effort uh, by a lot of uh, team members. Uh, there's almost 200 uh, providers that help with the vaccination efforts alone. Um, and uh, many different people who that are working uh, on making sure that people experiencing homelessness have the best opportunities, not just to uh, prevent themselves from getting infected with COVID, um, but also uh, to seek, uh, you know, appropriate housing and support services. And, you know, I think uh, there's lots of folks across the county uh, that can talk to, to all of those efforts uh, here at Public Health. You know, we try to do our part to be a good team player uh, with the with the broader effort, which is to secure uh, permanent so permanent housing and in those places where it's appropriate supportive housing for people experiencing homelessness. With that, we could go on to the next question. And I come from Claudia Pescito with KNX. Hi there. Um, okay, three questions. Are we past the peak of this latest search? Given how contagious and widespread Delta is, do you think we need to update the definition of close contact? And then um, yesterday, many of us reported on this outbreak at Grant Elementary in Hollywood. Uh, LA Unified said it involves seven cases of school-based transmission, all concentrated in one classroom. I'm not asking for any information that would violate HIPAA here, but I think a lot of parents might be wondering how you could have that kind of transmission in a in a classroom where everyone is presumably wearing masks. So if you could talk about that, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, let me let me take the last question um, just first because is this a great question and I know it is top of mind for so many people. Um, so you know nothing there, there's nothing uh, unfortunately uh, that's been perfect uh, with our efforts to you know really stop the spread of COVID. Uh, we have super powerful tools, but none of them are perfect. Uh, in a school setting, um, even if there is full compliance uh, with the mask uh, requirement while students are indoors. Uh, in, a, in a school that's doing everything right, there are uh, other periods during the day where that's, that same group of students uh, may in fact uh, be unmasked and primarily that's eating and drinking. Um, whether that's happening outdoors in the cafeteria or in the classroom, uh, there are periods of the day where students can be unmasked. Um, and therefore, you know, even with everybody staying fully masked, You've got some periods during the day where, where students may be unmasked, and that may also include, you know, some outdoor recess times. I mean, our team obviously work closely with all schools that have these outbreaks to try to see if we can identify what factors may have contributed, but it may be hard to figure out exactly what it was. Um, there are uh, other situations. It, it's not, not it's not this situation, but there's there was a case up north where there was a teacher who ended up uh, being infected. And for a small part of the day, she had taken off her mask um, as she was doing her lesson. Um, and, you know, again, while masks provide a, a significant amount of protection, they're not perfect. Uh, and a, a lot of kids in that class had an exposure while she had her mask off uh, and ended up, uh, again, testing positive later on. So imperfect wearing of masks indoors can also contribute uh, to that situation as well. So I, I won't get into the specifics of, of what happened in this classroom. I, I just want to acknowledge everyone is trying very, very hard, um, but because nothing's perfect, uh, there are going to be times when there will be transmission. In these cases where there are outbreaks, uh, one thing the Department of Public Health does is we go in and do an investigation to try to see what we can figure out. And if then there are steps that we can take to mitigate so that this doesn't happen again, we work closely with the school community to go ahead and implement those. Um, but as I noted, there are outbreaks that are happening at schools and these, this is a one example, but there will be more um, as we do our very best uh, to create a lot of safety, knowing that, that nothing is 100% perfect at, at the moment. Um, and going back to your, uh, uh, other two questions. Are we past the peak of the surge? Hard to know. Um, you know, we're, we're certainly not seeing a significant decline. Uh, we're seeing some, I would define this more as stabilizing. 
uh, and we uh, we have a lot of risk right now. So um, in in sort of this period uh, right now, we've got a lot of folks uh, getting back to more normal routines. We've got you know well over a million children uh, back in school, um, and all of the staff and and teachers that support those children and their learning. We have many more people also going back to work as some companies bring people back. Um, and we still have the Delta variant uh, circulating uh, widely in LA County um, as the dominant, uh, you know, sort of um, uh, virus strain that, that we're seeing here. And uh, that, you know, Delta isn't less infectious today than it was a week ago. Uh, so I'm not sure I would say we're past the peak. Um, I'm hoping that we're stabilizing, uh, that we continue to, to pay a lot of attention to mitigation, and most importantly, we've got to get the vaccination numbers up and, and up significantly. Um, it, the, uh, the, the issue around updating the definition of close contacts is, I think Delta has made it harder <laughs> for us to get a good sense from the research about what that definition may need to look like because it's relatively new. A lot of the data that people have been looking at is data from the spring and the early summer, which wasn't when Delta was dominating. Uh, so now we're back to sort of looking at what do we know about Delta and uh, should it in fact, uh, you know, after we get ample evidence, uh, would, should it in fact uh, require us to think differently about the definition of close contacts. I will say that um, we, all along, uh, we have known that um, distancing is, is a really good tool to use, but especially in indoor spaces, this virus can be aerosolized and it does mean that you wanna have good ventilation in your indoor spaces and you wanna keep those masks on and use as high a grade of a mask as possible. We can go on to the next question. And that'll come from uh, Emily Albert Reyes with Los Angeles Times. Hi, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Um, so I, I have three questions, uh, two related to, actually, I guess they're all sort of related to schools, but um, uh, what percentage of the county's coronavirus testing is currently happening at LA Unified? Um, what are some examples of high risk sports and activities? You mentioned that the CDC guidance says to not have these activities during periods of high transmission unless all are vaccinated. Is LA County planning to follow that guidance? And if so, when? Um, and then more broadly, I mean, given the rise in cases among kids, including kids too young to be vaccinated, how worried should we be and should we be doing anything differently? Um, uh, so let's just start with the last question. Um, you know, I think we all need to constantly be paying attention to what is the information that we have, because we try to share it with everybody so that everyone knows the same thing that we know, which is that we are seeing a lot more transmission uh, among children. Uh, some of this is to absolutely be expected because many children haven't been around other children for a long period of time now. And as they get back to school and their other activities, um, there's just a lot more contact. It's similar to what we saw uh, when we reopened uh, restaurants and bars and retail. Um, as people started doing more intermingling, there was an increase in cases. The issue for us is to make sure that uh, we mitigate against uh, significant increases in cases uh, by taking appropriate actions uh, where possible. And in this case, we are doing some things. You know, we're requiring indoor masking uh, for all students. We're we're strongly recommending a whole host of other protections um, that will, in fact, add what we say are these layers of uh, a protection uh, for children who cannot get vaccinated. That layering becomes super important uh, when you have high rates of transmission in the community. And we, we all need to sort of do our part on that. It's not just at schools that we need to layer protection, it's outside of schools as well. Um, so if we wanna see a reduction uh, in the number of children that are getting infected, we're going to have to do a lot, you know, starting with all the adults around them and the teens around them need to get fully vaccinated. That really lessens the chance of passing on a tra transmission to your child or someone else's child. Um, and then, you know, doing indoor masking, uh, outdoor masking if it's crowded, infection control, and really thinking hard about how much risk you want to take uh, as you're doing activities 
uh, that may be riskier than others if you've got uh, children who are unvaccinated uh, in your household. Uh, in terms of uh, high risk sports, you know, uh, the CDC defines, you know, sort of this a little bit differently. We talk about high contact, moderate contact, uh, but similar here are the sports that we all talk about often, uh, including things like football and rugby, um, basketball, um, and uh, volleyball, especially when it's indoors, uh, has also been noted to have more risk now than uh, we were saying when it was outdoors. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, soccer. Uh, moderate risk, you know, we have a long list. Moderate risk is usually, you know, sports more like uh, baseball and low risk are sports where, you know, you're, you're pretty much by yourself uh, cross country. Uh, some of the, um, you know, archery, I mean, the whole host of sort of more individualized sports. Uh, we are not planning on aligning fully with the CDC guidance um, at this point, which is why we've added in a testing layer um, instead. You know, we think it's better to just try to do more testing um, uh, to put in again a layer of protection as opposed to just closing out all these higher risk sports and activities um, from children. We know children are desperate to get back to doing what they love. But we do have to put in some layers of protection. You know, I hear every single day from uh, so many people that are, are really concerned uh, with the adding of additional layers of protection um, and feel very confident that there's there's no risk uh, with the activity that their children are engaged in. But, you know, there's pretty much no team sport at this point in LA County where we haven't had uh, exposures. Um, so I, I just want to want to say um, some of it is on the field, some of it is off the field. Really hard uh, for for us to ensure compliance uh, with you know sort of a set of rules about you know how people can comport, uh, how much distancing, et cetera. So at this point, it seems like testing is a, is a decent strategy to try to add in a, a layer of protection where there's going to be a lot of contact. Uh, and then I don't have the answer about what proportion of our tests uh, that are done each day are from LA Unified. I can say that I think we're averaging now, you know, somewhere between 90 and 100,000 tests a day. Uh, and I do believe that LA Unified has reported uh, somewhere between 30 and 40,000 tests a day, maybe even as, maybe even slightly higher now. Um, but I'd have to go back and, and get you the exact numbers on that. Um, I can take one more question, and I know we're we need to then move on to Spanish. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll go to uh, uh, Stephanie Dazio with the Associated Press. Hi there. Thanks for taking uh, the last question. I appreciate it. Um, real quick, are you seeing any significant problems with fake vaccine cards, uh, given the growing number of vaccine requirements and mandates? Um, and what do you believe is causing the Black case rate to go down and the Latinx case rate to go up? Thank you. Yeah, um, thanks a lot in, in, for both those questions. Um, you know, we, we're probably not where people are going to report uh, as much the fake uh, vaccination cards. So I, I'm not sure where your best source of information. I mean, we've heard of isolated incidences. We haven't seen a lot, um, you know, in terms of sort of employers who are requiring it of their employees. Uh, saying that, you know, it's been a big problem for them. We certainly haven't heard from those businesses that are requiring a vaccination a status verification from their customers. That doesn't mean it's not happening. I do think that um, most folks are, are trying hard to be in compliance. Uh, as with everything, there's a small number of people that will not follow the rules. But I think the vast number of people um, that are going to places where there are these requirements, uh, you know, particularly, you know, for for uh, a recreational activity are, are going uh, being in full compliance. And I think, you know, businesses that are requiring it for their employees are, are doing their very best to make sure that they're getting uh, accurate information from their employees. I would just encourage everyone. This isn't the place to cheat. Um, at all, because it creates a lot of risk, uh, both for you as sort of the unvaccinated person pretending you're vaccinated, but also for other people around you. Um, and in terms of, um, 
What was the other question, Stephanie? Sorry. Um, why is the black case oh, rate uh, yeah. going down while the Latinx yeah. is going up? I, I mean, we don't, you know, it's it's the first time we've seen, you know, really a, a decrease of any significance. Um, you know, I, I'm hopeful that we are increasing uh, vaccination rates. I'm also hopeful that for folks who are not vaccinated, uh, they're being more careful and and um, really um, it might be helping that so many places are uh, really trying hard to adhere to a set of safety protocols, you know, including businesses uh, where many people may be working and, and that may enhance uh, safety as well uh, for black residents. And I'm, we were surprised to see um, the increase again in Latinx cases. Uh, it's, it's puzzling because they've had more of an improvement in um, getting folks vaccinated. Uh, we're going to go back and, and try to do some, you know, more uh, surveying and try to get better information uh, from our case and contact tracing lists about what kinds of activities may be contributing. Uh, but we are also surprised and 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 in some ways uh, saddened uh, to see another increase in cases among Latinx residents who have been coming in uh, at much higher numbers to get vaccinated. Uh, with that, um, I'm going to end. I'll turn it back over uh, for remarks in Spanish. Thank you all uh, for for everything you're doing. Uh, sorry we had so much uh, to report out today. Um, we're trying to figure out how to balance the need to get information out to everyone with not to have these uh, run so long. So we may be doing some kind of modifications uh, starting next week on the timing and the frequency of the briefings, but we'll keep you posted. Great, thank you. And if we didn't get your question, you still have one, uh, you can send us an email at media uh, at ph.lacounty.gov. Uh, thank you, and uh, remarks in Spanish will begin uh, in about five minutes.
Okay, Monica, you all set? Yes, I am. Okay, Great. you can begin. Okay, thank you so much, Tim. Gracias por acompañarnos en la sesión informativa de hoy. Esta tarde hablaremos sobre nuestras tendencias de casos, hospitalizaciones y muertes por estado de vacunación, grupo de edad, raza y etnia, y brindaremos algunos detalles sobre las características de las personas hospitalizadas por COVID por estado de vacunación. También revisaremos nuestro progreso de vacunación y daremos una actualización sobre casos, brotes y estrategias de mitigación y prevención en las escuelas. First slide, please. Nos entristece informar 31 muertes más ocurridas. Al menos 24 de las personas que murieron tenían problemas de salud preexistentes. Esto eleva el número total de muertes a 25,181 en el Condado de Los Ángeles. Queremos señalar que debido al aumento del volumen de pruebas en el Condado de Los Ángeles, ha habido retrasos recientes en el procesamiento de los resultados de laboratorio en nuestro sistema de datos. Los días recientes no se informaron y los recuerdos, los recuentos de hoy incluyen datos atrasados de días anteriores que se procesaron en el sistema ayer. Estamos trabajando para aumentar la velocidad y la capacidad de procesamiento y esperamos que el procesamiento pronto se mantenga al día con el aumento de volumen. A todos los que han perdido amigos y familiares durante este momento difícil, les deseamos paz y consuelo y nuestras oraciones están con ustedes. Hoy estamos reportando 3,226 casos, lo que eleva el número total de casos en el Condado de Los Ángeles a 1,394,488. Hasta la fecha se han realizado pruebas a más de 8 millones de personas y estos resultados se han informado al Condado de Los Ángeles. La tasa de casos positivos de nuestra prueba diaria es de 2,75%, una disminución con respecto a la tasa del mismo día de la semana pasada del 3,74%. Eso probablemente refleja los aumentos en las pruebas rutinarias de detección que ocurren especialmente en personas que no presentan síntomas. Nuestra tasa de casos promedio diaria con un retraso de tres días es ahora de 26,6 casos por cada 100,000 personas, una disminución pequeña, un poco más de 1%, con respecto a la tasa de casos con un retraso de tres días de la semana pasada de 28,1 casos por cada 100,000. Hay 1,731 personas actualmente hospitalizadas con COVID-19, una disminución de 59 personas durante la semana pasada. Actualmente hay 334 investigaciones abiertas en entornos residenciales congregados y entornos no residenciales con al menos un caso confirmado de COVID. Next slide, please. Para evaluar el riesgo de COVID en el Condado de Los Ángeles, usamos los indicadores y umbrales de los CDC para categorizar el contagio comunitario de COVID-19. Observará que este marco utiliza una tasa de casos acumulada de 7 días, es decir, el número de casos por cada 100,000 durante la semana pasada en lugar de una tasa de casos diaria. El contagio en el Condado de Los Ángeles permanece en el nivel alto. Nuestra tasa de casos acumulada en 7 días es ahora de 188,2 casos nuevos por cada 100,000 residentes, lo que representa una bienvenida disminución del 8% con respecto a la semana pasada. Next slide, please. Este gráfico muestra las tendencias de casos, hospitalizaciones y muertes en nuestro condado desde el comienzo de la pandemia hasta el 18 de agosto de este año. Aunque los casos representados aquí por la línea de tendencia verde se informan a tasas que, que oscilan de 2,500 a 3,000 casos por día, vemos una disminución en el número de casos promedio desde 7 días. En la última semana, los casos han disminuido alrededor de un 15%. Sin embargo, con el aumento de las pruebas rutinarias de detección durante las próximas semanas, esperamos que nuestro número de casos siga siendo alto. El incremento de las hospitalizaciones se ha desacelerado un poco, aumentando durante la semana pasada a un promedio de 1,777 camas ocupadas por personas que dieron positivo en un día determinado. Las muertes también aumentaron un 6% durante la última semana a un promedio de 7 días de 18 muertes por día. Este virus continúa causando enfermedades graves y potencialmente mortales entre muchos de los infectados, 
y nuestras pérdidas se vuelven aún más trágicas por el hecho de que casi todas se pueden prevenir con unas vacunas extremadamente seguras y ampliamente disponibles. Next slide, please. Como siempre, hacemos un seguimiento de la eficacia de las vacunas analizando las experiencias de todas las personas vacunadas. Esta diapositiva muestra datos a escala para aquellos que están completamente protegidos por las vacunas. El recuadro verde grande representa a los 5,2 millones de residentes que están completamente vacunados. El pequeño recuadro púrpura en la esquina inferior izquierda de este recuadro representa a los 32.700 678 personas completamente vacunadas que dieron positivas por COVID el 24 de agosto de 2021. Si bien este es un aumento del 20% con respecto a la semana pasada, menos del 1% de todos los vacunados se han infectado con COVID. De los que dieron positivo, 881 fueron hospitalizados frente a 742 la semana anterior. Esto se traduce en un pequeño aumento de 0,017% de todas las personas completamente vacunadas. Las muertes en este grupo durante este lapso también aumentaron de 68 a 95 con un pequeño aumento al 0,0018% de las personas totalmente vacunadas que fallecieron. Estos incrementos graduales, vemos la realidad de que las vacunas no brindan una protección del 100% contra las infecciones. Cuando la propagación comunitaria es alta, es probable que se infecten más personas completamente vacunadas. Sin embargo, también vemos en estos números la realidad de que las personas completamente vacunadas continúan estando extraordinariamente bien protegidas de la hospitalización y es muy poco probable que mueran a causa de COVID. Next slide, please. En este siguiente grupo de diapositivas mostraremos los resultados por estado de vacunación estratificados por raza y etnia. En todas estas diapositivas, los grupos no vacunados están representados por líneas de puntos, mientras que los grupos vacunados están representados por líneas continuas. A partir de esta semana, los datos de personas parcialmente vacunadas no se presentarán en estas diapositivas, ya que su experiencia fue diferente, puede ser diferente a la de los que no están vacunados. Con un número relativamente pequeño de personas parcialmente vacunadas entre casos, hospitalizaciones y muertes, aún no hemos completado un análisis de la experiencia del grupo. Esperamos poder compartir esto con ustedes en las próximas semanas. Esta primera diapositiva muestra que la tasa de casos más alta se encuentra entre las personas afroamericanas no vacunadas, representada por la línea azul punteada, seguida de las personas latinas y blancas no vacunadas, representadas por las líneas punteadas grises y rojas. Es importante señalar que si bien los afroamericanos continúan teniendo la tasa de casos más alta, ha habido una disminución del 28% en esta tasa durante las últimas dos semanas. Estamos preocupados por el aumento continuo en la tasa de casos entre los residentes latinos no vacunados, que han visto aumentar su tasa de casos en un 200% durante el último mes. Mientras tanto, los casos han aumentado más lentamente entre los miembros vacunados de estos grupos y entre los residentes asiáticos vacunados y no vacunados, representados por líneas verdes continuas y punteadas. Next slide, please. Esta diapositiva muestra las tasas de casos en adultos. Observará que las tasas difieren considerablemente tanto por estado de vacunación como por grupo de edad. Tasas más altas se encuentran entre los adultos no vacunados entre las edades de 18 y 49 años, representadas aquí por la línea sólida naranja. Las siguientes tasas de casos más altas se encuentran entre los adultos mayores no vacunados y debajo de ellos los adultos jóvenes vacunados en la línea verde continua y los adultos mayores vacunados tienen las tasas más bajas. El mayor riesgo entre las personas más jóvenes no vacunadas probablemente se deba a que se entremezclan con muchas otras en sus trabajos, sus escuelas y en su vida social. Las tasas de casos, de, la, perdón, las tasas de casos han declinado ligeramente en todos los grupos. Next slide, please. Continuaremos informando sobre las experiencias de los niños menores de 18 años a medida que las escuelas vuelvan a impartir instrucción en persona. Como puede ver, hay una diferencia de aproximadamente cuatro veces en la tasa de casos entre los niños vacunados, representados aquí en la línea puntuada verde, y los niños no vacunados. 
representados aquí en la línea punteada naranja. Es importante destacar que si bien las tasas de casos entre casi todos los demás grupos de edad disminuyeron el mes pasado, los casos entre niños no vacunados aumentaron de 73 a 307 casos por 100 mil y hubo un aumento menor entre los niños vacunados de 11 a 78 casos por 100 mil. Next slide, please. Cuando, examin cuando examinamos los datos sobre quién está hospitalizado, puede ver una vez más las tasas de hospitalización más altas se encuentran entre los residentes afroamericanos no vacunados, representados aquí por la línea azul punteada, seguidos por los residentes blancos y latinos no vacunados, representados por las líneas rojas y grises. Mientras tanto, las tasas de hospitalización siguen siendo muy bajas entre las personas vacunadas de todas las razas. Parece que las tasas de hospitalización disminu disminuyeron para las personas afroamericanas y latinas no vacunadas en las últimas dos semanas y se estabilizaron para otros grupos, lo que brinda la, esper la esperanza de que si podemos mantener disminuyendo este número de casos, también el número de, hosp de hospitalizaciones disminuirá. Next slide, please. Cuando miramos por grupo de edad quién está siendo hospitalizado, ahora podemos ver que la tasa de hospitalización más alta continúa estando entre los adultos mayores no vacunados, representada aquí por la línea discontinua naranja. Si bien hubo cierta estabilización en las hospitalizaciones en este grupo de edad durante la segunda semana de agosto, los adultos de 50 años o más no vacunados tenían un aún más de 15 veces más probabilidades de ser hospitalizados que sus contrapartes vacunadas. Las hospitalizaciones en adultos jóvenes no vacunados, representadas aquí por la línea naranja continua, también están aumentando. En relación con los adultos no vacunados, las tasas de hospitalización entre los adultos vacunados de todas las edades siguen siendo muy bajas. Next slide, please. La diferencia en las tasas de hospitalización de niños vacunados y no vacunados sigue siendo particularmente sorprendente. Aunque las cifras de niños son muy pequeñas, las tasas de hospitalización de niños no vacunados es de aproximadamente una hospitalización de niños por cada 100 niños, 100 mil niños. Sin embargo, esto es mucho más alto que las hospitalizaciones prácticamente inexistentes entre los niños vacunados representadas por la línea sólida puntuada verde. Es importante señalar que una vez más en la línea de tendencia punteada naranja que representa a los niños no vacunados se encuentran los niños menores de 12 años que no han sido aprobados para recibir las vacunas COVID-19. Next slide, please. Observamos las diferencias entre las personas mayores de 16 años hospitalizadas con una prueba de COVID positiva en función del estado de vacunación. En la primera línea de este cuadro, observará que la edad media de las personas hospitalizadas que está completamente vacunadas es 15 años mayor que la de las personas hospitalizadas que no están completamente vacunadas. Como lo informamos la semana pasada, cerca de un 3% menos de personas hospitalizadas que estaban completamente vacunadas fueron admitidas en las unidades de cuidados intensivos que sus contrapartes que no estaban completamente vacunadas, un 14,9% en comparación con un 17,7% y que una proporción más pequeña estaba entubada, un 5,8% en comparación con 7%. Combinados estos hallazgos sugieren que la vacunación contribuye a un curso de hospitalización menos severo entre las personas infectadas con COVID que terminan con una enfermedad grave. Nuestros equipos han estado revisando las historias clínicas de personas hospitalizadas diagnosticadas con COVID este año. Entre los pacientes hospitalizados por COVID o una posible complicación relacionada con COVID, aquellos completamente vacunados que estaban lo suficientemente enfermos como para requerir hospitalización tenían más probabilidades de tener enfermedades crónicas al inicio del estudio. Si bien solo alrededor de un tercio de las personas que no están completamente 
completamente vacunadas tienen tres o más comorbilidades, casi la mitad de las personas completamente vacunadas que están hospitalizadas se incluyen en esta categoría. Ciertas afecciones se destacaron por, por ocurrir con mayor frecuencia entre las personas hospitalizadas completamente vacunadas que entre sus contrapartes no vacunadas, incluida la diabetes tipo 2, presión arterial alta, que ocurrieron aproximadamente 1,5 veces más comúnmente entre las personas hospitalizadas completamente vacunadas, trastornos neurológicos o de desarrollo neurológico, que eran aproximadamente tres veces más frecuentes, y cáncer, que era aproximadamente cuatro veces más común. Next slide, please. Las vacunas continúan ofreciendo protecciones poderosas similares contra la muerte. El mismo patrón que vemos en las tasas de hospitalización entre los grupos raciales y étnicos se manifiesta en las tasas de mortalidad con estas tasas más altas entre los residentes afroamericanos, blancos y latinos no vacunados representados por las líneas punteadas en azul, rojo y gris. Las tasas de mortalidad se mantienen estables en todos los demás grupos vacunados, así como entre los residentes asiáticos no vacunados. Next slide, please. Seguimos viendo una tendencia al alza en las muertes. Nuestra tasa de mortalidad en adultos mayores de 50 años no vacunados, indicados por la línea naranja discontinua, aumentó 10,3 a 14,1 muertes por 100,000 personas en la semana entre el 7 y el 14 de agosto. También estamos viendo un aumento mucho más lento y bajo en la tasa de mortalidad entre los adultos no vacunados entre 18 y 49 años, con un aumento en el mismo intervalo de 1,3 a 1,9 muertes por cada 100,000 personas. Next slide, please. Esta diapositiva resume por la semana del 14 de agosto algunos de los datos anteriores sobre casos, hospitalizaciones y tasas de mortalidad por estado de vacunación y raza y etnia y coloca junto a él el porcentaje de cada grupo racial y étnico que ha recibido al menos una dosis de la vacuna. Notará que las, casas de, las tasas de casos, hospitalización y muerte son más altas entre los miembros no vacunados de todos los grupos que entre los vacunados. Además, mientras las tasas de casos y hospitalización son más altas entre nuestros residentes afroamericanos no vacunados, los residentes blancos no vacunados son ahora el grupo con las tasas de mortalidad más altas. Las personas vacunadas continúan siendo, perdón, continúan teniendo tasas para todos los resultados que son muchas veces más bajas que sus contrapartes no vacunadas. Tienen de 4 a 8 veces menos probabilidades de ser hospitalizadas y de 5 a 7 veces menos probabilidades de morir a causa de una infección. La tasa de mortalidad entre los residentes afroamericanos es actualmente tan baja que ni siquiera podemos hacer esa comparación. Next slide, please. Al observar estos mismos resultados por grupo de edad para la semana que terminó, el 14 de agosto, vemos que las tasas de casos más altas continúan entre los adultos jóvenes no vacunados de 18 a 49 años con una tasa de 510 casos nuevos por cada 100,000 personas y que las personas no vacunadas en todos los grupos de edad tienen de 4 a 5 veces más probabilidades de infectarse que sus contrapartes vacunadas. Las hospitalizaciones fueron prácticamente inexistentes entre los niños vacunados menores de 18 años, aunque una de cada 100,000 niños no vacunados fue hospitalizado. Prácticamente no hubo muertes por COVID en niños independiente del estado de vacunación. Los adultos jóvenes no vacunados entre 18 y 49 años tenían 27 veces más de probabilidades de ser hospitalizados que sus homólogos vacunados con una tasa de 24 hospitalizaciones por cada 100,000 personas. Mientras tanto, los adultos mayores no vacunados de 50 años o más tienen más de 15 veces más probabilidades de ser hospitalizados que sus homólogos vacunados, con una tasa de 84 hospitalizaciones por cada 100,000 personas. 
Y las diferencias en las tasas de muerte son dramáticas. Los adultos no vacunados entre 18 y 49 años tienen una tasa de muerte de casi dos muertes por 100 mil personas, comparado con casi no muertes de personas vacunadas de este grupo de edad. Mientras tanto, los adultos mayores de 50 años que no están vacunados tenían 28 veces más probabilidades de morir como resultado de COVID que sus homólogos vacunados. Seguimos viendo una amplia protección de la vacuna contra todos los resultados en todos los grupos de edad. Next slide, please. Como siempre, nos mantenemos enfocados en nuestra principal prioridad de facilitar la vacunación de quienes aún no están vacunados, especialmente dada la alta tasa de contagio y la amplia evidencia de la efectividad de las vacunas. Al 22 de agosto, el 90% de los residentes del condado de Los Ángeles de 65 años o más habían recibido al menos una dosis de la vacuna, al igual que el 75% de los residentes de 16 años o más y el 74% de los residentes de 12 años o más. El 64% de los residentes de 12 años o más han sido completamente vacunados. De los adolescentes del condado de Los Ángeles, entre las edades de 12 y 17, el 61% ha recibido al menos una dosis y el 63% está completamente vacunado. En todo el condado se han administrado 17,364 terceras dosis a personas inmunodeprimidas. De todos nuestros casi 10,3 millones de residentes del condado de Los Ángeles, incluidos aquellos que no están en los grupos aprobados para recibir la vacuna, el 63% ha recibido al menos una dosis y el 55% está completamente vacunado. Recibimos muchas preguntas del público y de nuestros aliados sobre las vacunas de refuerzo que, como hemos señalado en el pasado, son diferentes a las terceras dosis que se ofrecen en las personas inmunodeprimidas. Las inyecciones de refuerzo, cuando estén disponibles, estarán destinadas a aumentar los niveles de anticuerpos en personas que probablemente ya hayan tenido una buena respuesta inmunitaria protectora a la vacuna, pero cuyos niveles de anticuerpos puede que se hayan disminuido con el tiempo. Las vacunas de refuerzo no son exclusivas de las vacunas de COVID. También administramos vacunas de refuerzo contra el tétano a los adultos cada 10 años para aumentar la humanidad a las infecciones por tétanos. En el caso de las vacunas COVID, las vacunas de refuerzo siguen siendo una probabilidad, no una recomendación. Actualmente no hay recomendaciones de los CDC para estas vacunas de refuerzo y el anuncio hecho reciente sobre estos tenía la intención de ser una guía con fines de planificación. Los CDC y la FDA están revisando datos sobre este tema y una vez que estos datos indiquen la necesidad de vacunas de refuerzo, las recomendarán. Next slide, please. Este cuadro muestra el número de primeras dosis administradas cada semana, aunque tenga en cuenta que debido a un retraso en el informe de datos, las cifras de la última semana a menudo subestiman el número de dosis administradas entre 4,000 y 10,000 dosis. Actualmente, la tabla indica que entre el 16 y el 22 de agosto, administramos alrededor de 69,345 dosis en toda la red del condado, pero esperamos que este número aumente un poco a medida que se informe dosis adicionales. Aunque estamos inmensamente agradecidos con todos en este condado que ya se han vacunado y continuamos trabajando con nuestros aliados de vacunación en todo el condado para vacunar a tantos residentes como podamos lo más pronto posible. Necesitamos hacer un mejor trabajo para llegar a aquellos que aún no están vacunados para que nos ayuden a frenar la propagación del COVID. Next slide, please. Aunque seguimos teniendo grandes brechas en la vacunación entre los subgrupos de edad raciales y étnicos, hay repuntes prometedores en muchos de los grupos con menor cobertura de vacunación. Los grupos con tasas de vacunación por debajo del 50% están marcados en rojo esta semana, mientras que el resto están en blanco. La buena noticia es que hay muy poco rojo en esta diapositiva, sin embargo, los subgrupos donde vemos tasas de vacunación extremadamente bajas se concentran por completo en los residentes afroamericanos y latinos que ya han sufrido mucho durante esta pandemia. 
A pesar de que estamos complacidos de que continuemos viendo grandes aumentos en las tasas de vacunación en los subgrupos de jóvenes raciales y étnicos, existe una brecha persistente entre los residentes afroamericanos y otros grupos raciales y étnicos que permanece incluso a medida que los números dentro de estos subgrupos aumentan lentamente. Si observa los totales por grupo de edad que se encuentran en la parte inferior de esta tabla, notará que todos los grupos de edad, con la excepción de los de 12 a 15 años, ahora están vacunados a una tasa del 64% o más, un paso en la dirección correcta mientras luchamos por la inmunidad comunitaria. Sin embargo, tenemos mucho espacio para progresar, especialmente entre nuestros adolescentes y adultos jóvenes, que aún enfrentan muchos riesgos. Necesitamos ver ganancias más rápidas para revertir la desproporción en los casos, hospitalizaciones y muertes que están tan estrechamente vinculados, como se ve en esta tabla, al estado de vacunación. Next slide, please. Con la reapertura de muchos distritos escolares en todo el condado, nos gustaría informarles sobre lo que estamos aprendiendo de nuestras visitas a las escuelas durante las últimas semanas. Como dijimos la semana pasada, nuestros equipos de asistencia técnica escolar, o STAT, por sus siglas en inglés, se comunican con las escuelas de manera proactiva para evaluar la preparación preventiva y asesorar sobre las op oportunidades y opciones de mejora. Durante visitas recientes, los educadores de estos equipos han descubierto que las escuelas con las más significativas mejoras de seguridad cuentan con un amplio apoyo dentro de la comunidad escolar para promover e implementar la guía de uso de mascarilla. También tienen herramientas de detección previa de síntomas que permiten la detección temprana de estudiantes enfermos, programas consistentes de pruebas de detección de COVID-19 y señalización en todo el plantel para recordar al personal y a los estudiantes sobre la seguridad, el uso de mascarilla, el distanciamiento y la higiene. Mientras tanto, las áreas de mejora en muchas escuelas han incluido la atención al control de prevención de multitudes, la creación de equipos de cumplimiento de seguridad, la identificación de espacios para establecer salas de, alis, de aislamiento y la implementación de estrategias de control de multitudes a la hora de las comidas. Además, nuestros equipos notaron el potencial para mejorar la comunicación con los padres y el profesorado sobre las oportunidades de pruebas y de vacunación y sobre los requisitos de identificación de casos y rastreo de contactos. Muchas escuelas también se beneficiarían de más señalización, protocolos de reapertura actualizados y una mayor desinfección en los espacios compartidos. Nuestros equipos planean agregar apoyo adicional a las, a las escuelas para ayudar con el rastreo de contactos y la implementación de la cuarentena apropiada de estudiantes y personal. Como recordatorio, los estudiantes y el personal completamente vacunados en las escuelas de kinder a grado 12 no están obligados a ponerse en cuarentena siempre que per permanezcan asintomáticos durante el periodo de cuarentena de 14 días. Enviaremos person personal de salud pública a las escuelas que identifican un gran número de estudiantes expuestos para ayudar a administrar la cuarentena de los estudiantes y el personal, reconociendo cuán es interesante y perjudicial es la cuarentena para un entorno de aprendizaje estable y para los padres y quienes cuidan a la juventud. Es importante señalar que siempre se requiere identificar a los contactos cercanos de un caso confirmado en todos los entornos, incluidos los lugares de trabajo, reuniones sociales y los lugares para profesar la fe, para tratar de separar a aquellos que pueden estar en riesgo de propagar el COVID. El aislamiento y la cuarentena son muy efectivos para reducir el contagio una vez que se identifica un caso positivo y tenemos requisitos estándar en la mayoría de los entornos. También somos conscientes de que muchos distritos escolares y padres nos han pedido que nos alineemos con la política de cuarentena modificada del Estado para estudiantes de kinder a grado 12. Dado que los datos que respaldan una política de cuarentena modificada en las escuelas se desarrollaron con base en los datos recopilados la primavera pasada, 
pre-Delta y hemos visto grandes aumentos en los casos entre los niños en edad escolar, determinamos en agosto que era mejor no modificar la política de cuarentena hasta que podamos ver los datos de casos y brotes que tenemos para las escuelas del Condado de Los Ángeles. Estamos en proceso de revisar estos datos y trabajar con la Oficina de Educación del Condado de Los Ángeles y los distritos escolares para determinar la mejor manera de reducir los riesgos en las escuelas. Si nuestros datos admiten una baja transmisión entre casos y contactos cercanos en, en entornos escolares, actuaremos rápidamente para enmendar la política de cuarentena. Como siempre, Tratamos de ser cautelosos en situaciones que pueden poner en riesgo a, a los niños, los educadores y las familias. Y usamos los datos que tenemos para tomar decisiones informadas sobre la mejor manera de mitigar la propagación de un virus peligroso. Desearíamos que fuera más simple y que la regla no tuviera que cambiar, pero el virus ha cambiado y todos necesitamos flexibilidad para adaptarnos a una variante más peligrosa. Estamos agradecidos con los distritos y los padres que han trabajado tan duro para apoyar a sus escuelas y garantizar la seguridad de los estudiantes, sus maestros y el personal que trabaja en las escuelas de nuestro condado. Next slide, please. Los primeros datos que tenemos los, sobre las escuelas nos dan una lección. Esta tabla muestra el número total de informes de casos individuales recibidos de entornos escolares del kinder al grado 12 en todo el condado durante la semana del 16 al 22 de agosto y también muestra cuántos de cada tipo de entorno escolar ha informado uno, dos o tres o más casos durante este lapso. Como puede ver, se reportaron un total de 3,186 casos nuevos durante esta semana pasada. Muchos de ellos se presentaron en el Distrito Escolar Unificado de Los Ángeles, donde todos se someten a pruebas semanalmente. Y el segundo número más alto proviene de otras escuelas de kinder al grado 12 en el Condado de Los Ángeles. En los entornos que atienden a los niños, la proporción de casos vacunados fue de un solo dígito, mientras que el 17% de los casos nuevos en la las oficinas escolares y lugares de trabajo fueron vacunados. La inmensa mayoría de los sitios con casos informaron solo un caso. Sin embargo, las 15 escuelas del distrito escolar y las 48 escuelas informaron dos casos, y 84 escuelas del distrito y otras 39 casos, escuelas informaron tres o más casos. Next slide, please. Estamos vigilando de cerca los brotes en las escuelas del Condado de Los Ángeles y los programas afiliados a las escuelas, incluidos los deportes juveniles. Un brote probable es cuando hay tres o más casos con contagio probable que ocurren en las escuelas o actividades escolares. Durante la semana pasada vimos tres brotes por semana con entre 23 y 37 estudiantes y entre 0 y 60 miembros del personal infectados cada semana. En lo que va de esta semana hasta ayer, hemos visto cinco brotes que involucran un total de 27 estudiantes y tres miembros del personal. Anticipamos que la tendencia a que los brotes se incrementen a medida que las escuelas reabren y continuaremos trabajando con las escuelas para prevenirlos, investigarlos y manejarlos a medida que ocurren. Vale la pena, pena señalar que de los 14 brotes escolares que se abrieron en agosto, la mitad estaban asociados con deportes escolares. Las actividades deportivas en equipo tienen algunas características que las convierten en entornos particularmente desafiantes para controlar el contagio. Next slide, please. Nos gustaría compartir con ustedes un ejemplo de un entorno deportivo juvenil donde ocurrieron brotes para ayudarlos a comprender por qué son tan desafiantes. Entre el 30 de julio y el 20 de agosto se presentaron nueve brotes entre los equipos de danza y porristas de la escuela secundaria que involucraron a 10 miembros del personal y a 131 estudiantes. Los nueve brotes se asociaron con campamentos a bajo techo de dos a tres días que, que tuvieron lugar en instalaciones fuera del condado de Los Ángeles. Todos estos campamentos reunieron estudiantes, atletas de varias escuelas y se pidió a las escuelas que hicieran cumplir sus propias políticas de uso de mascarillas entre los estudiantes que asistieron. Según lo que se informó, 
muchos de los, de los asistentes no usaron mascarillas durante las actividades para animar a los deportistas y durante el baile. La mayoría de los equipos con brotes habían utilizado autobuses escolares y vehículos alquilados para el transporte, con uso de mascarilla variable por parte de los miembros del equipo durante el tránsito. Ocho de los nueve brotes se presentaron entre atletas que compartieron habitaciones de hotel con entre dos a seis personas por cuarto. Entre el 33% y el 67% de todos los que estaban en riesgo de infección dieron positivo y entre los cuatro brotes que afectaron a personas vacunadas, entre el 38 y 77% de los casos se produjeron en personas totalmente vacunadas. Aún no ha habido hospitalizaciones ni muertes asociadas con estos brotes. Nuestros hallazgos de estos brotes sugieren que el riesgo de contagio es alto con el contacto cercano, sostenido y sin uso de mascarilla entre las personas personas, especialmente cuando realizan un esfuerzo físico. Next slide, please. Esta diapositiva resume las recomendaciones de pruebas de detección de los CDC para las actividades en escuelas de kinder al grado 12, incluidos los deportes juveniles que varían según el nivel de contagio comunitario. En áreas de contagio sustancial, como se indica en el recuadro rojo, los CDC recomiendan que se ofrezcan pruebas de detección a los estudiantes que participan en deportes y actividades de alto riesgo, especialmente a los que no están vacunados. En el nivel de alta transmisión comunitaria, que es donde nos encontramos ahora en el condado de Los Ángeles, los CDC recomiendan cancelar o realizar deportes de alto riesgo y actividades extracurriculares virtualmente a menos que todos los participantes estén completamente vacunados. Los deportes de riesgo moderado en comunidades con alta propagación deberían requerir pruebas semanales para todos los participantes no vacunados. Next slide, please. Debido a que los programas de deportes juveniles son un entorno de alto riesgo para el contagio de COVID, la semana pasada publicamos requisitos y mejores prácticas para las ligas deportivas juveniles. Nuestra guía actual de deportes juveniles intenta alinearse con las de los CDC sin excluir a los que no están vacunados de participar en deportes de alto riesgo o actividades extracurriculares y en cambio agregar capas de protección adicionales. De acuerdo con esta guía, se requiere que todos los participantes se cubran cuando están en interiores, independiente del estado de vacunación, incluso mientras realizan actividades físicas. Los participantes pueden quitarse las mascarillas temporalmente al comer o beber y se les anima a mantener una distancia de seis pies de los demás mientras lo hacen. También se les permite quitarse el cubrebocas durante los deportes acuáticos en interiores. Recomendamos que las prácticas y los juegos sean trasladados al aire libre siempre que sea posible y a los jugadores que traigan más de una mascarilla a las prácticas y juegos en caso de que se mojen o ensucien durante el juego. También se requieren mascarillas a todos los espectadores, entrenadores y empleados cuando estén adentro, independiente del estado de vacunación. Los empleados que trabajan en entornos deportivos para jóvenes están sujetos a los estándares de Cal OSHA y, mi, y nuestra guía se alinea con esos estándares para requerir que los empleados proporcionen respiradores a los empleados no vacunados y fomenten el uso de doble mascarilla o, respira, o respiradores para aquellos que están en contacto cercano con personas que no están completamente vacunadas. También recomendamos que los empleados usen mascarilla en espacios al aire libre concurridos y que se les exija que usen cubrebocas en eventos deportivos al aire libre a los que asistan más de 10,000 personas, excepto mientras comen y beben. Es altamente recomendable la vacunación para todos los estudiantes atletas de 12 años o más y para todos los entrenadores y, perdón, y personal del equipo. También pedimos a los participantes y sus familias que se examinen para detectar síntomas de COVID-19 y exigimos que los programas excluyan o aíslen a los participantes, entrenadores y espectadores con síntomas y que notifiquen de inmediato a Salud Pública cualquier caso confirmado. Next slide, please. 
En entornos deportivos juveniles recomenda, recome, recomendamos esfuerzos continuos para fomentar el distanciamiento y reducir el hacinamiento siempre que sea posible. Esto incluye trasladar las actividades al aire libre para reducir el riesgo de contagio y para acti las actividades que deben realizarse en el interior, reducir el número de participantes, entrenadores y espectadores en cualquier área. Sugerimos que los entrenadores fomenten las actividades de desarrollo de habilidades durante las prácticas y limiten las actividades que impliquen un contacto sostenido de persona a persona. Además, los eventos de equipos no deportivos como el cenas y otras reuniones sociales solo deben realizarse al aire libre con medidas de distanciamiento establecidas. Se requieren pruebas de rutina independiente del estado de vacunación para los atletas y el personal que participan en deporte de riesgo moderado o alto. Puede encontrar una lista de estos deportes en el documento de orientación de nuestro sitio de internet. Las pruebas deben realizarse una vez por semana como mínimo y recomendamos altamente que los participantes y el personal no vacunados se realicen la prueba dos veces por semana. Las pruebas realizadas en las escuelas satisfacen este requisito y se realizan semanalmente. Cambiaremos nuestra guía para requerir una prueba negativa de todos los atletas y miembros del personal dentro de las 72 horas posteriores a la competencia entre equipos. Y si el resultado de la prueba no está disponible antes de la competencia, es posible que el atleta o miembro del personal no esté presente en el evento. La ventilación juega un papel importante en la reducción del riesgo de contagio. Para actividades en interiores, asegúrese de que el sistema de calefacción, ventilación y aire acondicionado del edificio esté en buenas condiciones de funcionamiento y se considere la posibilidad de utilizar purificadores de aire portátiles de alta eficiencia o mejoras en el edificio que permitan la filtración de aire eficaz. Cuando el clima y las condiciones de juego lo permitan, abra las ventanas y puertas y, y considere usar ventiladores grandes para soplar el aire interior hacia afuera. También recomendamos disminuir la ocupación de un área interior donde no se pueda aumentar la ventilación y abrir las ventanas de los autobús, autobuses y camionetas del equipo durante el tránsito. El lavado de manos sigue siendo una medida de prevención importante y recomendamos colocar estaciones de lavado de manos o desinfectante en los puntos de entrada a las prácticas o juegos y fuera de los baños comunes. Next slide, please. Cuanto más casos veamos en las escuelas, más personal y estudiantes requerirán cuarentena o aislamiento. Como recordatorio, tanto la cuarentena como el aislamiento se refieren a periodos de contacto reducido con los demás. La diferencia es que la cuarentena tiene lugar después de una exposición, mientras que el aislamiento tiene lugar después de la aparición de los síntomas. Nos gustaría revisar lo que los padres y las escuelas deben saber sobre la cuarentena y el aislamiento. Primero, los padres deben saber que no se debe enviar a los niños a la escuela si están bajo órdenes de aislamiento o cuarentena o si tienen fiebre u otros síntomas de enfermedad. Una vez en la escuela, los estudiantes pueden ser evaluados para detectar síntomas de COVID que a menudo se superponen con los síntomas del resfriado o se les puede tomar la temperatura al momento de ingresar a la escuela. Es posible que a los niños no se les permita ingresar a la escuela si están enfermos o tienen fiebre al llegar. Si los estudiantes desarrollan síntomas durante el día escolar, pues pueden ser aislados de otros estudiantes y enviados a casa. Por lo tanto, es aconsejable que los padres y cuidadores tengan un plan de cuidado infantil de emergencia en caso de que de que ocurra algo inesperado. Para las escuelas de, 15, de kinder al grado 12, nuestras reglas para poner en cuarentena los contactos cercanos no requieren que el personal y los estudiantes completamente vacunados estén en cuarentena. Recomendamos que se chequeen para detectar los síntomas de COVID-19 durante dos semanas después de su última fecha de exposición y que se realicen una prueba de COVID de tres a cinco días después de su última exposición. En caso de que desarrollen síntomas o de positivo en la prueba, se tratarán como un caso y estarán sujetos a las pautas de aislamiento que se detallan en nuestro sitio de internet. Los contactos del personal que no estén vacunados o que estén parcialmente vacunados deben estar en cuarentena 10 días a partir de su última fecha de exposición. Y aunque pueden regresar a la escuela a partir de entonces, deben usar cubrebocas y chequearse para detectar los síntomas de COVID-19 hasta el día 14. 
También recomendamos que el personal se haga la prueba entre 3 y 5 días después de la exposición para permitir un diagnóstico temprano. Si la prueba es positiva, el personal debe ser tratado como un caso y sujeto a pruebas de aislamiento. Los contactos de estudiantes que no estén vacunados o que estén parcialmente vacunados deben ponerse en cuarentena 10 días después de su última fecha de exposición. La cuarentena se puede acortar si una prueba que se realiza el día 6 o después de la última exposición arroja un resultado negativo. En este caso, el estudiante puede finalizar su cuarentena el día 8 si no se presentan síntomas. Las escuelas pueden tomar algunas medidas para reducir la cuarentena innecesaria de los estudiantes mediante la planificación de asientos en las aulas, fomentando el distanciamiento físico tanto como sea posible fuera de las aulas y alentando a todos los estudiantes de 12 años a, en adelante a vacunarse lo antes posible. Next slide, please. Sabemos lo ansiosos que han estado nuestros estudiantes, padres y maestros y personal de, regres de regresar a la escuela este otoño y todos tenemos muchas esperanzas de que podamos prevenir las interrupciones en el aprendizaje que resultan de las altas tasas de contagio en nuestras escuelas. A continuación, se incluyen algunos pasos que todos pueden tomar para que las escuelas de su comunidad tengan la mejor oportunidad de mantenerse seguras y abiertas. Para los niños de la escuela intermedia y secundaria, la mejor manera de mantener abiertas las escuelas es vacunándose. Cuando esté vacunado, es menos probable que se contagie el, con el COVID, incluso si está expuesto. Esto significa que incluso si está expuesto, es probable que su tiempo de cuarentena sea unos días más corto y es menos probable que se enferme si se infecta, lo que significa un retorno más rápido a la vida, como de costumbre, una vez más que se resuelve la infección. La, la participación en el rastreo de contactos es fundamental para garantizar que se notifique a los contactos cercanos que deben ponerse en cuarentena antes de que tengan la oportunidad de infectar a otras personas. Queremos señalar que esta semana actualizaremos nuestra norma del funcionario de salud para exigir a todos los que reciban una orden de aislamiento que llamen a salud pública dentro de las 24 horas posteriores a la recepción de la orden para, para participar en una entrevista de rastreo de contactos a menos que ya hayan sido entrevistados por salud pública. Y el rastreo de contactos va de la mano con el cumplimiento de las órdenes de aislamiento y cuarentena. Mantenerse alejado de los demás cuando está enfermo significa que es menos probable que les contagie la infección y eso hace que sea menos probable que necesiten ponerse en cuarentena. Participar en el rastreo de contactos y seguir las órdenes de cuarentena puede marcar la diferencia entre tener un puñado de niños o cientos de niños fuera de la escuela. Y por último, usar la mascarilla en interiores y en espacios exteriores con mucha gente significa que es mucho menos probable que se le considere un contacto cercano y se le requiera ponerse en cuarentena, incluso si está cerca de alguien que tiene COVID. También lo hacemos menos propenso a infectarse y enfermarse. Los adolescentes mayores de 12 años pueden recibir la vacuna Pfizer en cualquiera de nuestros sitios de condado y de la ciudad sin una cita previa y puede visitar nuestro sitio de internet vacunatelosangeles.com para encontrar un sitio cerca a usted. Además, muchos distritos escolares, incluidos varios cuyos volantes se muestran aquí, ofrecerán vacunas en las escuelas intermedias y secundarias durante las próximas semanas. Pedirle a su escuela un calendario de vacunación puede ser también una opción. Muchas gracias y hasta la próxima.